Chapter 1, Creation Testifies. Last year I spoke at a women's retreat in Alaska. I knew two things before going. It would be cold, and according to the travel blogs, Alaska would be beautiful beyond expectation. You barely have to leave the airport to see the foothills surrounding Anchorage. Even at dusk, I could see the tops covered with snow and feel the massiveness of their presence. For a week after the retreat, my family and I saw glaciers and mountains and rivers in the ocean. We drove through forests, climbed a mountain, and cruised on a boat around Prince William Sound. We witnessed the mystery of the Bortide, gazed at tiny, mid-sized, and enormous waterfalls, soaked in hot springs during a snowstorm, and were overwhelmed by an abundance of breathtaking views. On top of all that, the northern lights bedazzled the dark with fluorescent green waves our last night before flying home. For seven days, we saw glory upon glory upon glory and majesty beyond belief. And that was just the offerings of one state on one tiny corner of the globe. Whether you live in the desert or the mountains or by the ocean, the beauty of creation is never far away. Each place has its own trees and vegetation and flowers and animals and birds and bugs. The sun rises and the sun sets. Cloud formations and moisture variations create colorful canvases too intense to capture, even with our sophisticated cameras. Thousands of years ago, a shepherd boy turned king, David, wrote this in what we now refer to as Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Verses 1 through 4. David recognized that waterfalls and mountains, trees and grass, moose and bears, hawks and eagles all say the same thing without words. God is the creator. He loves variety. He is amazing and powerful and wise enough to have the moon work with the tides and to send flares from the sun to dance majestically through the night sky. He created berries for bears and people to enjoy. The sun offers warmth. Plants and trees produce oxygen. Bees spread pollen. Pollen fertilizes plants that produce flowers. And flowers produce fruit. We can't fathom the exquisiteness of creation. It is far more than we can comprehend. But every day in winter, spring, summer, and fall, we get to look outside and marvel at God's handiwork. An Old Testament man named Job lost his children, his property, and his health. He lamented that he could not question God concerning his treatment, which from his vantage point seemed woefully unjust. Even in his complaint, Job recognized his insignificance next to a powerful God who controlled creation. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pilates and the constellations of the south. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. Job 9, verses 4 to 10. God answered Job's lament and appeared to Job in a storm. In response to Job's complaint, God used creation to show his omnipotence. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstones while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place? When I said, this far you may come and no further, here is where where your proud waves halt. Job 38, 
verses 4 to 11. But God reminded Job it was not just the earth that testifies to his greatness. The characteristics of each of God's creatures tell of God's wisdom and the role each creature would play. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the wings and the feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sun, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly, as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. Yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is its stronghold. From there, it looks for food. Its eyes detect it from afar. Its young ones feast on blood, and where the slain are, there it is. Job 39, 13-18, and 27-30. to The ostrich can't fly, but can run faster than a horse. The eagle soars to heights unknown to many birds. Both are mighty birds, but both are totally unique. The eagle flies but can't run. The ostrich runs but can't fly. And God in his wisdom created both for a purpose and to display the wonders of his limitless imagination. Creation testifies to the greatness of God, but just as important, it testifies to God's love for us. When God created the world, he had us in mind. Earth was his gift to us a place where we could dwell, and with every sunrise and sunset, with every walk along a lake or stream or hill or mountain, with every drive through hills and valleys and fields and forests, God professes his love. As my dear friend likes to say, the world would have been beautiful with one kind of tree and one kind of flower, but God loves us so much. He created over 70,000 different kinds of trees and over 350,000 flowering plants. He gave us the cardinal and the robin and the blue jay and the hummingbird. And if that wasn't enough, he gave us seasons. He gave us flowers for spring and shrubs to bloom in summer. He gave us rhubarb, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, cranberries, and apples all ready at different times. He gave us buds and blossoms and leaves, and just before the leaves drop for winter, they turn the most magnificent shades of yellow and orange and red and purple. And even winter, which in the Midwest region of the United States is known for snow and cold, carries its own beauty. Fresh snow glistens with a magnificence that couldn't be achieved if a dump truck of diamonds were scattered on the ground. Frost covers the trees and the ground, and the whole world glistens. All of this is God's gift to you and me. Surely he loves us to give us such an elaborate gift. But maybe you aren't in a place of beauty. Maybe you look at a swamp and not a lake. Or perhaps it's all mosquitoes and spiders and centipedes, and the birds are more menace than objects of beauty. The vegetation near you is infested and rotting instead of vibrant. The Apostle Paul explains, The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Romans 8, verses 20 through 22. Adam and Eve experienced creation in perfection. Plants weren't diseased, trees didn't die, and storms didn't destroy. But the second they took a bite of fruit from the forbidden tree, sinning against God, they, the animals, the vegetation, and all creation suffered the effect of sin. That effect is decay. 
It's mold and cancer and ash borer and blight and dry rot and floods and famine and drought. And Paul tells us this should make us long for heaven. Right now, we're in bondage to sin. Our redemption through faith in Jesus doesn't free us from feeling those effects. We still get old and sick and break bones. The decay and groaning are meant to lead us to long for the freedom and glory we'll experience when this life is behind us. Perhaps you are currently experiencing the worst of life in this world. I mentioned Job earlier in this chapter. He experienced the worst for a time too. Job 2 verses 7 and 8 tell us, Satan afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of pottery, broken pottery, and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. When the fire of God took Job's servants and sheep, when wind took the breath of his children, when raiders carried off his oxen and donkeys and camels, and when sores covered his body, Job sat in the ashes. Somewhere there was beauty. Somewhere there was joy. Somewhere the sun was rising and setting. But Job couldn't bask in beauty when his body ached and his soul despaired. Pain can make the beauty of creation so hard to see. It may be there, but who cares about a sunset or a flower or a bird when everything hurts. Loss of health and life and income are the reminders that this world is in our home. They nudge us to long for our permanent residence with God in heaven forever. The Apostle John recorded what God showed him when he allowed John to get a glimpse of heaven. John saw a multitude of people. This is what an angel told him about them. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Revelation 7, verses 14 to 17. Tears are for earth. The discomfort we feel, whether it's physical, emotional, or relational, has an expiration date. It can't follow us to our new home with Jesus forever. God gave us a beautiful earth to spend our days But these are our days of tribulation. Our forever will be spent in unrivaled beauty, untarnished by sin. That's why we hang on. The sorrows here can't compare with the joy there. The Apostle Paul put it this way, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Romans 8, 18. Sorrow here will end. Our joy there will not. Every blue sky and blue bird, every sunrise and sunset, every glorious view here is meant to remind us of a loving God who gave us an amazing home here, but is preparing an even better forever there.